Throughout its history, starting with the establishment of its first criminal gangs in the early 19th century, New York City has had a pretty bad reputation for crime. In the mid-20th century, it began getting especially bad, to the point that, by the 1980s and the dawn of the crack epidemic, it was one of the most crime-ridden cities in America, infamous for its subway violence, street hoodlums, and political corruption. Thankfully, that trend turned around a decade later, and the city has become a relatively safe metropolis the last year notwithstanding, but even as far back as 1974, with the entire nation absorbed by the Watergate scandal, New York City's notoriety made it the perfect setting for a story about out-of-control crime and the fears of a government that has lost all respect for any notions of liberty. It provided a backdrop for a fledgling filmmaker who would one day become recognized as an underappreciated creative genius, a man by the name of John Carpenter. In the future year of 1997, the United States of America has become so overcome with crime that its population has vacated Manhattan Island, walled it off, filled it back up with the nation's violent criminals, and surrounded the once great city with an ever-vigilant military force. Terrorist insurgents have hijacked Air Force One with the intent of crashing into the citywide prison, but luckily, the President has managed to use an emergency escape pod at the last minute. However, he still lands in the middle of Manhattan, where it doesn't take long for the prisoners to find him. In a last-ditch effort at rescue, Snake Pliskin, a jaded Special Forces veteran caught attempting to rob the Federal Reserve, is sent in with a simple choice. Save the President within 24 hours, or die trying. Before we go any further, if you could hit that like button, we might be able to save this channel from the anarchy of YouTube obscurity. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you in advance. This movie was a special request from patron John Burrell, who gets additional thanks for his support. With all that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. After dropping out of USC Film School in 1974, John Carpenter made his first film, the low-budget sci-fi screwball comedy Dark Star. After his first trip to Manhattan, he was inspired to write his first draft of Escape from New York, for which he also drew parallels to Watergate, then in its height. He reportedly also drew inspiration from the Harry Harrison novel Planet of the Damned. He shopped his script around, often from the trunk of his car, but no studio was interested, citing its excessive violence and Carpenter's lack of success. However, in 1978, Carpenter's reputation started to find momentum with the release of two films. The first, Irvin Kirshner's Eyes of Laura Mars, was based on a story and treatment written by Carpenter, and it was a significant box office hit, despite mediocre reviews. The second, of course, was Carpenter's own Halloween, one of the most profitable horror films ever made, earning over $65 million against a $300,000 budget. In the following year, Carpenter directed the successful made-for-TV film Elvis, starring Kurt Russell, and a year after that, he again achieved box office success with The Fog. Finally, with his name established as a rising star, John Carpenter had more pull in the industry, starting with Avco Embassy Pictures. Avco Embassy's head, Robert Remy, had given Carpenter a two-picture deal for The Fog and The Philadelphia Experiment, another script Carpenter had been working on, but which was proving to be problematic to complete. The Philadelphia Experiment was passed on to others being rewritten so many times that Carpenter didn't want and wouldn't receive any credit in the final film. To replace it, Remy agreed to help finance the script languishing in the director's trunk, Escape from New York. In order to help polish that six-year-old script, Carpenter brought in his friend Nick Castle, the same Nick Castle who played the shape in the original Halloween and would go on to direct The Last Starfighter. Carpenter also had help from his frequent collaborator Deborah Hill, though she is only credited as a producer alongside Larry Franco, who would go on to work with Carpenter on several more projects, such as The Thing, Starman, and They Live. This updated script retained much of Carpenter's cynicism following Watergate, but it now included aspects of the Iran hostage crisis as well. With a finished script, Carpenter secured additional funding from international film investors and Goldcrest Films International, 
which together agreed to pay for half of the film's six to seven million dollar budget. This was an enormous budget for Carpenter, whose previous feature films cost a combined total of $1.5 million. Most of the characters in Escape from New York were written with specific actors in mind. For the lead role of Snake Plissken, for example, Carpenter wanted Kurt Russell. Even though Avco Embassy tried to pressure him into casting a more seasoned film actor like Nick Nolte, Charles Bronson, or Tommy Lee Jones. Carpenter did audition Nick Nolte and Jeff Bridges, the latter of which he would later cast in Starman, but Kurt Russell lobbied hard for the part and was always Carpenter's first choice. Russell was, at the time, struggling with typecasting following over a decade of working as a child actor for Disney, and despite his Emmy nomination for Elvis, few people saw his potential for movie stardom. With Carpenter's enthusiastic support then, Russell worked hard to develop his darker take on Snake's character, which he describes as, quote, a mercenary whose style of fighting is a combination of Bruce Lee, the Exterminator, and Darth Vader, with Eastwood's vocalness, unquote. When I get back, I'm gonna kill you. On top of a strict diet and exercise program, he also tried to stay in character between takes, despite the fact that he'd never been and would never become a method actor. He did take the eye patch off, though, because even though it was his own addition to the character, Russell did worry about damaging his depth perception. The hard work paid off in the end, as Snake Plissken is easily one of his most iconic roles, a character it's impossible to imagine anybody else playing. Oh, and yes, the memes are true. One of Russell's stunt stand-ins was a man by the name of Dick Warlock. Carpenter wrote the closest thing to a female lead, Maggie, for his then-wife Adrienne Barbeau, who'd previously starred in Carpenter's The Fog and was probably best known for playing Carol Trainer in Maud. I would talk more about her performance in Escape from New York if I could, but every time she's on the screen, I find myself terribly distracted for some reason. Carpenter also wrote the small role of Girl in Chock Full of Nuts for Russell's then-wife, Susan Hubley. Cop. An asshole. The role of Cabby, possibly the nicest guy in the citywide penitentiary, was written specifically for veteran actor Ernest Borgnine, who has literally over 200 credits to his name, but who I'll always remember for The Poseidon Adventure, Mikhail's Navy, and of course SpongeBob SquarePants. What? <laughs> Other veteran actors with whom Carpenter filled out his cast are Harry Dean Stanton as Brain, a role originally intended for Warren Oates, but when Oates took ill, he recommended the alien actor to replace him. Spaghetti Western staple Lee Van Cleef as Hauk, whose scenes were all filmed over the course of a single night, and of course Dr. Loomis himself, Donald Pleasance, who used his own experiences as a POW in World War II to play the kidnapped President of the United States. Also worth noting are soul legend Isaac Hayes in the role of Duke, professional wrestler Douglas the Arkansas Ox Baker as Slag, Halloween 3's Tom Atkins as Remy, and uncredited Jamie Lee Curtis as the voice of the narrator. In 1988, the crime rate in the United States rises 400%. And of course, George Buck Flower as a drunk. I'm the president. Sure, I'm the president. I, I knew when I, I got this thing, I, I'd be president. One other cool cameo is this Secret Service agent, played by Stephen Ford, the son of President Gerald Ford. You may have noticed that Tom Adkins' character, Remy, shares a name with Avco Embassy head Robert Remy. And there are other characters with not-so-coincidental monikers, such as Romero and Cronenberg, big names in horror. Production began in the late summer of 1980, the bulk of the movie was filmed in East St. Louis, Illinois, where it was much cheaper and easier to shoot a film. East St. Louis does double for a wrecked New York City surprisingly well, especially in the aftermath of fires, which left large portions of the city relatively vacant and in disrepair. St. Louis proper, the more famous gateway city across the river in Missouri, was also used, with some filming done in Union Station and the Fox Theater. The landmark Chain of Rocks Bridge across the Mississippi River on the northern edge of St. Louis stood in for the fictional 69th Street Bridge in which the climax is set. In order to protect the Illinois state government from potential liability issues, John Carpenter purchased the bridge for a dollar, 
and then sold it back to Illinois when the movie was finished for the same price. Some location shooting was done in New York City, where Carpenter and his team were the first film crew to ever be granted exclusive access to Liberty Island, in Atlanta, where they filmed an entire high-speed train sequence that was cut from the film, and in Los Angeles, where they used the Sepulveda Dam. A few sound stages were also used for many of the interior shots, and some of the computer graphics were expertly faked, such as this wireframe animation that was actually done by filming reflective tape put over a miniature of Manhattan under a blacklight. Most of the visual effects, it should be noted, were put together by Roger Corman's New World Pictures, with a rising star as their primary matte painter and director of photography, a 26-year-old wunderkind by the name of James Cameron. Escape from New York released in July of 1981, to a warm critical response and an enthusiastic domestic box office total of $25.2 million. It proved to be a major boon for both John Carpenter and Kurt Russell, and the film is considered a seminal action film of the 1980s, inspiring everything from Rambo to the Terminator. It was also an inspiration behind William Gibson's landmark cyberpunk novel Neuromancer, while Snake Plissken is the obvious template for Hideo Kojima's Solid Snake in the Metal Gear series. Even J.J. Abrams claims influence from Escape from New York, explaining that its poster was the catalyst behind the famous decapitation of Lady Liberty in Cloverfield. There was a novelization that filled in some of the backstory and included much of the film's cut content, along with a less-than-stellar sequel in the 90s and a line of comic books and other media centered around the character of Snake Plissken in the early 2000s in addition to a proposed remake slash prequel that has been languishing in development hell for almost a decade now. Escape from New York, which celebrates its 40th anniversary this year, is an interesting film to be sure. On the surface, it feels like a testosterone-fueled, hyper-gritty action film with its tongue planted firmly in its cheek, designed to entertain in an almost adolescent fashion. Bliskin, what are you doing? Playing with myself. I'm going in. The characters are inarguably cartoonish, and there are beats that feel like violence happening merely for violence's sake. Carpenter's credentials as a master of genre fare are on full display here, and I'm not sure he gets enough credit for what he did for R-rated action. Dig just a little bit under the surface, and there's some serious depth. Sure, it's a pretty exaggerated and surreal look at America, but it did resonate with audiences at the time as a statement about the growing police state, the rising crime rate, and a jaded sense of government corruption that had taken hold of certain parts of the country. Watching it these days gives it an almost prophetic air, with the film featuring terrorists crashing a plane into Manhattan, a growing protest movement against racially biased police brutality, and a few other things that might be even more relevant today than they were in 1981. The film is loaded with complex morality, with a convicted criminal and ruthless killer who makes no apologies as the protagonist, and the alleged heroes behind the scenes portrayed as cruel slave masters and out-of-touch bureaucrats. The concepts of liberty and freedom are turned on their heads repeatedly, and the American flag is used all over the place as a kind of twisted commentary about where the country is headed. It's a cynical and relentless view of humanity, but that works for the kind of story Carpenter was trying to tell. A little human compassion. By any competent moral standard, the character of Snake Plissken should be irredeemable, but one can't help but cheer him on as he walks away from the man with a capital M, lights a cigarette, and destroys an important cassette tape in a last obscene gesture to the president who didn't seem to understand what had just happened. Snake, as a symbol of rugged independence, the potential for unorthodox redemption, and the stubbornness of vice, is a quintessentially American archetype, and one of the greatest action hero icons of all time. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite action anti-hero? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to support what I do even more, consider joining my Patreon to get early access to videos, get your name in the credits, and much more. My patrons vote on one movie I cover every single month. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when we'll witness the return of something we can't see, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
kill me now, Snake? I'm too tired. Maybe. 